200 years ago, there lived a composer by the name of the Swami Dikshitar. And he traveled and covered the sacred geography of Tamil Nadu and other places and composed a number of uh, compositions in praise of deities enshrined in these temples that he visited. And in doing so, he was actually forwarding a, one of the Hori traditions of uh, the, the saints that lived in the first millennium. Okay. So there's a number of compositions created by Dikshitar which are heard in Kacheris today. So I would like to ask you uh, folks to see what you feel when you perform the Kritis of Dikshitar. So let's start with Sahana. Um, when I perform them, I feel the image of the deity he's describing in the Kriti, since a lot of his compositions are descriptive, mm -hmm. and I feel the presence of the Kovil he's got inspired from to compose the Kriti. Good. Aditya? Um, when I sing them, because these Kritis are musically very exhaustive. Mm -hmm. They contain like lots of information about this ragam. I think when I sing them, I just feel very elevated. I feel like it takes the ragam to a whole new level, something that only like these compositions can really do. Good. Harsha. So when I sing Dikshitar's compositions, I always feel the just the amount of scholarship this composer should have had to compose a composition like that. It's the, you know, unlike Tyagaraja's compositions where uh, it is more about the feel of the Draksha Rasa, it's like the immediate feel of the Ragam you get the moment I start singing Manamiyala Kinchara or Brova Bharama. But in Dikshitar's compositions, uh, it's, uh, it's the entire, the way it, the composition, you know, you know, opens itself as I sing the Pallavi Anu, Pallavi and Charanam is, I can feel the intellect of the composer, I can feel the scholarship in addition to that emotion which is embedded, which is very esoteric. So Good. that's what I feel about his composition. Since Good. I was a kid, I have always loved it because of that. Good. Uh, what I can say about uh, experiencing Dikshitar's, Dikshitar's composition is, is, is that it's like an unfoldment of something very grand. Exactly. The way you relate to it as a child is different from the way you re uh, relate to it, re relate to it as, uh, um, as a young performer. And as you um, go up there, the way you relate to it changes. And uh, so what I want to ask you guys is uh, um, there's a feeling of discovery. Okay. When you sing the compositions of Dikshita, which you experience at different f stages in life. So what can you do to bring this feeling of discovery, wonderment, or vismaya, or the Adbhuta Rasa to your performance when you perform a composition of Dikshita? Again, let's go this way, Sana. Um, when I do it, I look at every single detail of the Kriti and um, notice every part of it, even like the small parts of it, and see what's unique about it, or see what's what's in the ragam that expresses the whole kriti overall. And it helps to keep an image of the deity, which the kriti is composed on, in your okay. mind when you're singing it. Okay. It really helps you immerse, get immersed in the ragam and the kriti. Sure. Can you name a kriti and a little bit of detail? Or can we, let's do that in the next round. So please have a few minutes to think about it. Aditya. Um, I just like to give a personal example of how I discovered something new about this Kriti. Mm -hmm. It's a Sri Rajagopala set to Saveri Ragam. Yeah. When I first learned it, like it, it, was, it struck me as an amazing song mm -hmm. because of the depth of the Ragam yeah. in the song. Mm -hmm. But I researched a bit more about the song and I looked at the meaning of the words and mm -hmm. I researched about the, the actual, um, the deity of the Kshetra yeah. at which the song was composed in. I think then that's when I felt that feeling of discovery because not only the ragam and the words were like amazing, but now what the words were saying and the ideas that they were getting at. I think that was the feeling of discovery that. Wonderful. Does, does any phrase in that composition appeal to you in particular? We'll come back to this, okay? Harsha. Uh, particularly, I... Uh, the real Vismaya aspect is, uh, especially since I was born and brought up in India and visiting temples and uh, I mean, my mother used to make sure I used to visit a temple before I make any trip. So it used to be a very common thing. So I, when I was making the temple trips, I was, it was okay. I was very young then mm -hmm. to even realize what it was. But once I started really analyzing the Dikshitar's compositions and I started singing, uh, it was somehow I used to get the special energy when I sing every okay. line of the composition. Mm -hmm. So I should probably give a specific example, like this Kriti Ranganayakam. Yes. So I have been singing this for like years and years. But uh, like just last December when I went to India, I was in Sri Rangam and uh, I took very much like a temple tour. But then it is it is a tour with uh, the, you know, the people who are in the temple. So the priests. And as he was explaining about every corner of the temple, I was like, I could clearly literally just envision the Ranganayakam Kriti and Sri Bhargavim. Nice. I could just see the Kriti in front of me. 
so i immediately just sat and i sang beautiful. those so that is i think uh, something which is outstanding about his compositions beautiful so any composition any phrase um before like last year um i knew this composition govind rajaya in ragam suruti hmm. by dikshitar and um i sang it at this temple it was um lord govinda and ever hmm. since then i've got this new perspective on the kriti and the ragam and when i sing it it's i actually like really like singing this kriti nice aditya yeah so like in sri raju gopala in the in the anupala vidhas a line charu champa karanya mm-hmm. i researched this and apparently before the temple at mannar gudi was constructed there used to be a forest of champaka flowers there okay. and the apparent like long time ago apparently goddess lakshmi herself appeared there mm-hmm. and because of that the flowers are so holy that even the bees refrain from drinking nectar from those flowers so that's the amount of like scholarship that's in that song beautiful okay yeah i i want to share share yeah harsha do you want yeah you just mentioned uh, right. so can, yeah. i mean yeah. i mean also certainly the neela neela the sharira line of yes Balagopal. of course that's somehow i always have a very special feel for seeing that line okay good see the example that i always relate to is this. see i learned the kriti shankaram abhirami manoharam as a kid uh, it's a very short composition it's a beautiful composition my teacher used to tell me that you need to sing this on a regular basis to keep good health i didn't know what it meant at that point in time then uh, i forgot that composition completely then in 1993 we went on a tour of south indian temples and we went to this place called the trikadavur and uh, many of you in the audience may be familiar with the place what is it known best for trikadavur is abhirami temple ah abhirami temple the abhirami andadi was composed was that is all i knew but when i went, went to the temple all i could see was a lot of old couples in uh, uh, in, in a wedding attire because they were undergoing the shatabhishekam and also the sashti uh, apurti the, the 60th birthday celebration there were elephants and people walking around in garlands so i was wondering what what is going on the temple is very crowded i didn't want to go there on a hot day and my mother said uh, let's go see the abhirami sanati but before that we went to the main shrine which was amrita ghateshwarar so then it, something struck me this is the song i know a song from that i learned when i was 10 shashi dharam amrita ghateshwaram okay maybe oh yeah something is coming back then what is the first line of the composition shankaram abhirami manoharam oh yeah so this is the abhirami temple then i look around this side and i see the sanadhi of kala samhara murti where uh, um, the shiva is portrayed as one who stops time and then was able to recollect the legend of markandeya so and i'm suppose most of you know the story of markandeya right Bal- markandeya was a young devotee of shiva and let's refer to him as mark for now and mark was a young devotee of shiva who was destined to die at the age of 16 but uh, when yama the lord of time comes and throws a noose around him it actually falls on the shivalingam and shiva emerges out of the shivalingam and stops time so it for the sake of markandeya so for the sake of mark time was stopped so he lived as a 16 year old man forever old person forever so that is uh, th- that's a stala puranam related to Mark- markandeya and that is portrayed there with shiva uh, uh, as kala samhara murti and all that began to click and the entire song came back to me although i had not heard it in a very very long time so that's when i realized hey this this is actually a discovery uh, uh, so every time i sing that composition now i think of when i went to that temple that time and uh, how this story kind of unfolded in front of front of my eyes so um, uh, so apart from your story with the with the uh, sri rangam temple and uh, ranganath so do you have any examples of uh, yeah, correlating dikshitar with yeah, temples yeah i can definitely relate to something like this i have learned bajre re chita uh, kalyani composition yeah. of dikshitar and you know and once i grew up and you know it was for my first child's you know we took him for his first birthday that's when you know when i was just going around the temple suddenly everything stuck why is this vaitishwaran kumbhel why is vaitinath and why are people coming in doing the uh, the salt and pepper offering there and who is muttukumara swami yes. as you go the the grandness of the entire temple is described in such a short way but as you move around the temple you can see the deity and the, the song reverberates so Correct. once even as a rasika when you listen to somebody singing this then the entire temple unfolds you you have a virtual tour what is the stala vriksham there what happened there what is the historical significance so that's the grandness of our dikshitar's composition yeah and the beauty of the holding is that dikshitar was actually following a tradition see there were the there were these uh, saints called the nayanmars and the alvars who lived in the first millennium and they traveled around writing Comp- compositions and praise of the temples that they visited 
So what Dikshita did, he was uh, he was what you would call a peripatetic composer. He was not stationed in one place at all. He was constantly going from one place to another. And what you get in his composition is an encyclopedic description of these uh, compositions. And for each person, there's one composition that uh, matters to them most based on their personal visit to a temple. Uh, so I'm going to ask the audience, what do you think, what, what, do you, what is the composition of Dikshita that most people are most familiar with? It, with? What is the most popular composition of Dikshita? Vatapi. Vatapi Ganapati, okay. And uh, uh, who is Vatapi Ganapati? See, Vatapi was a demon, okay, and uh, who was actually killed by, who was actually eaten and digested by uh, Agastya, okay. And Agastya was, a, was a, in some of the stories, he's uh, depicted as a devotee of uh, Ganesha. And Vatapi was a town in, which was originally known as Badami. Um, this was in part of the Chalukyan Empire. And when the Pallavas defeated them, one of the Pallava generals, he brought back the image of uh, Ganesha from uh, Vatapi, and it was referred to as Vatapi Ganapati. And this was enshrined in a place called Tiruchengatankudi. And uh, another image of uh, Ganesha commemorate, com commemorating this is, uh, is, was made later and was enshrined in the Tiruvaru temple. And this is, this is refer also referred to as Vatapi Ganapati. And there are a number of compositions of Dikshita in praise of Ganesha enshrined in the Tiruvaru temple, and this is just one of them. And uh, this composition used to be, we believe, used to be rendered in the Chauka Kala, in, a, in the slow uh, tempo. And can you imagine that? <laughs> so how do you sing it today? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the rapid bullet-paced compositions rendered in the beginning of a concert just for the sake of accelerating the pace of the concert and uh, for uh, yeah, and course, enlivening and it. And the too. Oh, yeah. And of, yeah, Sangatis, that's a good point. And who <laughs> added... It was a later edition. Oh, those, the Sangatis were a later edition because right. it was this uh, composer by name Mahavaidinath Ayer who, uh, who lived in uh, Tamil Nadu who added the tons of Sangatis to this composition. So today it has become a de facto standard to sing Vatapi Ganapati with uh, these uh, compositions. But what you need to remember is, if you go back and research the meaning of this composition, every phrase in it is uh, pregnant with uh, meaning. It alludes to the fact that this Ganesha is uh, enshrined, in, enshrined in the Muladhara Kshetram. Muladhara, Muladhara Kshetra Stitham. Okay? Then uh, Pura Kumbha Sambhava so uh, once upon a time, the, uh, the Muni that came from the uh, Kumbham, which is uh, uh, Agastya, worshipped Ganesha. So all these legends, uh, all these stories are, uh, uh, are kind of referred to in this uh, composition. So there is no hurry to rush through these comp compositions and sings for us in the end, particularly if you terminate the, rip rip the refrain with a va instead of vata bhiganapatim. Because va in Tamil means come here. So, so when he sings Varas, he might as well conclude with the whole line, Vatapi Ganapatim Bhajeham. Um, so I want to get back to the, f the question. How can you bring the feeling of discovery, wonderment, vismaya, vismaya, when you sing the compositions of Dikshita? So when you talk of discovery in Dikshita compositions, we talked about, you talked about Sahityam particularly, yes. right? Um, when you explore a ragam, for example, we take compositions from that era. We take Tyagaraja Kritis or Shama Shastri or Dikshidhar and look at them to get phrases of the ragam to understand what the ragam is. Uh, from a discovery standpoint, if you take take a ragam, say Chakravakam, uh, you there is a there is a sense of discovery when you when you look at the kriti and say, oh, these are the phrases in the ragam. I can use it. Mm -hmm. Now, Dikshidhar has used alternate forms of that ragam in multiple kritis. For example, Vegavahini. He has used it in Veena Pustakadharini. So there are, the character of the ragam changes based on the kriti. So are there any thoughts no, on no, that? No, no, let's go there. Vegavahini is Vegavahini. Chakravaham is Chakravaham. Correct. Okay, so let's there not are, compare the two. Okay? Completely two different ragams yeah. with the same notes. But now these days, there are many people who call Gajananayatam being composed in Vegavahini. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a sense of discovery in that that I feel. But what I, I would like to get your thoughts on what 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 was the purpose behind Chakravakam and Vegavani or, or ragas like that or composing two different kritis in the same raga? For example, Dvijavanti, there are two different kritis in that. Chetashri okay. or uh, uh, Akhilandeshri. So the way he has treated the ragam, same composer, but mm -hmm. the treatment is different. Okay, there's two major discussions that you are invoking here. I don't know if you want to get into the core of all that, but these, I will let me just briefly mention this here that uh, some of the compositions that we know of today of Dikshitars may not um, are being disputed today as to whether they were written by him or not. Akhilan Deshwari being one question. 
Okay, so let's not go near the, Vija, uh, the Vijayavanti for now, but let's pick uh, something else, for, for example, um, like uh, Gamaka Kriya, for, which we commonly refer to as uh, Purvika Lenin. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, so uh, Dikshitar followed the Raga system created and followed by the parampara of a musicologist by name Venkatamakhi. Okay? The, Venkatamakhi, the Venkatamakhi school f follows this nomenclature as well as this scheme of arohanas and avarohanas. We have another scheme which came up with a modern Melakarta scheme of ragas, which of scales, which we refer to as uh, the, the Melakarta, the, the Kanakangi Ratnangi scheme. Okay? And those are attributed to another musicologist by name Govindacharya. So the raga names are different in both the traditions. Dikshitar was very orthodox in his own way. So he stuck to the raga scheme, which was, which was followed by the Venkatamakhi Parampara. So I hope that answers your question. So you really cannot compare what we think is an equivalent raga and uh, uh, get into the question of did Dikshitar, did Dikshitar compose in Chakravaham or not? We really cannot go there. When we, look, when we want to learn a certain raga, how valid is it to look at a Dikshitar composition, especially since the names are different? If you want to learn Vega Vahini, if you want to learn Vega Vahini, you study Veena Pustaka Dharini in detail. Or if you want to learn Gamaka Kriya, of course, you're going to look at uh, Meenakshi Me Mudam Dehi. Or if you want to learn uh, uh, 14 different ragas, the essence of each of the ragas is conveyed very beautifully, like Chalanati, uh, Bhupala, then um, uh, uh, Shri, Gauri, etc., 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 and the Chaturdasha Raga Malika, which is uh, Sri Vishwanatham. Okay, so that's how I would go. And there's like two, 220 plus compositions. That's plenty to learn from in a lifetime. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the um, uh, one round and very quickly close it. So what would you do uh, to bring about that feeling of wonderment? Uh, one is certainly to, uh, if at all possible, you know, if you have visited the temples in which Dikshitar has composed, certainly yes. I think it's a uh, uh, very uh, important thing to do that, to get a real feel for his compositions. Mm -hmm. um, and other thing I realized very recently is that after attending few lecture demonstrations during the December season and uh, as I have started looking more into the, the mm -hmm. Sampradaya Pradeshini, mm -hmm. so there is a lot of, uh, like I would say there is a lot of wonder which is there in that book. Yes. And if one can ever actually sit and read and try to analyze, there is a... There is, I think, a lot more than what we hear in concert platform. Yes. For instance, Srinath Adi Guru Guha is the best example for that. Yeah. So, in fact, I didn't even realize that. I mean, we all knew that Srinath Adi had the Sarlai Versailles yeah, Trikalam in the first line. Mm -hmm. But then, actually, the second line has a Janta Versailles. Yes. And the entire Swaram, just the Swaram, if you look at the entire Charanam and the Anupallavi is basically a palindrome. Right. I think to, to like have this feeling of discovery, the best thing would be to, to go to the temple, but furthermore, to um, understand the importance of Dakshetra, to understand like the stories associated with Dakshetra, mm -hmm. like the Sala Vriksham and the, the details of Dakshetra, not just going there, but Good. really appreciating what is special about that. And, Good. Yeah. Good. Sana? Um, first thing you should do while learning a Dikshita Kriti is look at the meaning even before you start learning it. So mm -hmm. you get the full idea of the Kriti and all the concepts and everything that you know about it. So you, you can get really immersed in it while you're singing it. Okay, very good. So in conclusion, when you, uh, when you, if you want to bring the best in Dikshitra Kritis out, when you're performing them, understand them if possible, go to the sacred geographic location where he composed them and uh, just try to create, recreate the same feelings that you experienced when you were there. Thank you.